to me, it's the same thing when it comes to sales. So if ultimately the end value is having a customer who's satisfied and who's going to continue to deal with you. Welcome to this week's edition of the Loop Email Podcast. Uh, my name is Bushchan, and I'm very happy to say hello today to Tibor Shanto. Tibor, hi. Good day. How are you all doing? Uh, Tibor has been a sales leader for over 25 years, helping companies achieve and improve their revenue goals. Uh, you're ranked among the top 10 social salespeople by uh, Forbes. You've got a blog called The Pipeline mm -hmm. uh, that has been awarded uh, the top sales and marketing blog in uh, the top sales awards. And you are one of the top 10 uh, social salespeople as uh, identified by Forbes.com. I understand you've also written a book, Object Objection Handling, and yeah. you have worked on the book, Shift, Harness the Trigger Events that Turn Prospects into Customers. Yes. Uh, a very, very interesting, uh, a very interesting uh, background, uh, Tibor. Yes, sir. What is prospecting? Prospecting, in a broad sense, is really trying to find something of value in a broad, you know, mass of things. And I'll get specific, so you know, we'll bring it down to earth, um, and then finding that value and then evolving it. So. You know, it's interesting if you were to talk to a number of people and say, what is a prospector? Or draw me an image of a prospector. A good number of them would draw the old, you know, 49er types, you know, the old guys who would go down to the river and they would dole up a, a pan full of dirt and they would sift it out. And then they would find those little nuggets of gold and then they would work on those, refine them and take them to market and, you know, buy their wife's flowers or whatever they did with the money. So... To me, it's the same thing when it comes to sales. So if ultimately the end value is having a customer who's satisfied and who's going to continue to deal with you, then you have to sort of work that back and say, okay, well, that's not going to happen overnight, nor are they going to open the yellow pages and sort of say, yep, Tibor is the guy, right? I wish they would, but you know, so, you know, so we have to go about it and do what those miners did, right? So go out there and take this vast thing that we call our market and we begin to segment it in different ways. So we're beginning that sifting process. And then when we get it down to those, you know, that part of the river that we know has, you know, what we're looking for, you know, so they account based marketing personas, all that things that we all talk about. Then we do a little sifting and we see which of those are ready to play now because not everybody is ready and so on. So to me, that's prospecting. Now I know that that's a higher level answer than you were looking for. But I think we have to start with that, that our job as salespeople, I think, has been somewhat changed a little because, you know, I was, I was listening to somebody yesterday at an ERP presentation. So you had nothing to do with sales. It just had to do with workflows and things like that. Right. And they were talking about how you can bolt on an e-commerce element, you know, to take care of a segment of the market. Right. And they said, basically, you have an automated salesperson working 24 hours a day. Well, I sort of took offense because I don't think that's a salesperson. I think that's an order taker. And there's a big difference between taking orders and selling. So I'm talking about people who are sellers, not order takers. So it does reduce the audience that we're speaking to because a lot of people who have sales on their card or job description are really just order takers or are important facilitators of a stage of the revenue process. So as that piece of dirt goes through the process of being refined into you know, a wedding ring or whatever it's going to end up being, you know, along the way, it'll have, you know, one, you know, different stages of the process. But to me, prospecting is, again, engaging with the marketplace and identifying those people who would benefit from your product and then converting them into customers. And I'm sure that your follow up with some specifics and we can get into different techniques. But on the whole, unless you start with the thought that it's your job to go out there identify, find, and uncover, then you're not prospecting. I think most people these days who are given leads by a machine are basically just button pushers. Remember, before voicemail, we had answering services, you know, those ladies sitting there with the different, that's what most salespeople are now, it's mm -hmm. SDRs, you know. They're like... But if you go back to, uh, you know, there's a lot of theories about um, the, the, sort of how the consumer or the buyer has changed and uh, there's a lot of theory going out that uh, most of the uh, decision making in the heads of uh, buyers is actually um, made before they contact you. Is, is, is prospecting a dying 
uh, uh, concept or, or not? Is it is? And I'm not talking. You know, I'm not talking just about today. I'm talking about sort of. It's a dying concept, but not because it has any ills. It's being killed. So yes, it is dying, but I would say it's more homicide than you know, extinction. Um, because again, uh, of some of the things, but so so how can we? Sort um, of, because a lot of these people that are buying are sort of using social to buy. They're they're looking at, uh, you know, what are other people talking about your product? But but I, I think I think we're being fooled by things. I think you know if you look at it, like first of all, this, the the quote that you cite is is a bit different. What they say is they're fifty seven percent of the way through the journey yeah. before yes. they reach out to a salesperson. So I don't think it's correct to say that 57% mm -hmm. through the correct. decision, right? Correct. I think that yes. that's 57% of the journey. So now, if you're on a journey that wasn't initiated by a salesperson, right, then you're, you initiated that on your own. You're a willing buyer, you're in the marketplace, you're actively out there looking, whatever the reason is, whether it's because you've won a big contract and you need to increase capacity or whether, you know, a meteor just hit your factory and you need to replace capacity, whatever the reason is, you're out there on your own. But what percentage of the market does that describe? And I would argue it's about 10% or less of any given okay. segment. So you're saying right? traditional so prospecting is still the main facility or the main tool for 90% of the market. Is that well, so I'd say there's another 20% that what I, what I call are passively looking. So they might know that they need to, you know, maybe the lease on their factory is coming up in, in 18 months. Last time it took them four months to select the location. So they figure they've got about 12 months before they need to get into the decision-making mode. And then there's about 70% who are status quo, right? Like they're just doing their business, right? They do what they, you know, like they make you know, sinks and they make carpets and they make circuitry boards and they make nuclear power plants, but they're doing their business, right? They're not out there looking. So the implication that 57% of the way through, it tells you that they're only talking to a segment of the market. Does that 70% that's doing their day to day is not out there interacting with your content, right? There's an implication that they came to a keyboard, did a search mm -hmm. and found something, right? So we have to accept that 70% are not sitting at their keyboard because they haven't been motivated to do so because they're busy running their business. So, you know, how many people is that content speaking to and so on? And the other thing is that the people who are out there actively looking, the 57% of the way through, right? They have already something in mind when they started that search, right? So, you know, usually they have an identified problem, an identified need, an identified requirement. And that's why for a lot of companies, it's fairly straightforward. You know, do you have this pain? We have a better aspirin, right? And then the discussion takes place as to whether it's really a better aspirin or not. But the discussion is the same. Like if you talk to most salespeople, the one, number one thing they want to know from their prospects is what's keeping them up at night or what their, their pain is or what your problem is. Because we have a solution, you know, not the complete solution, but one element of the solution, right? But so if you happen to be prospecting, if you're an SDR and you happen to call one of these people who has self-identified themselves, they downloaded one of your white papers or they attended a webinar or they listened to this podcast, right? They've made the move on their own to get off their ass and do something, right? So when you call those people and you talk to them about their pain and their problem, it's going to resonate because they're in the market on their own. But if I call somebody in that 70% that could give a shit because they're doing their work on a day-to-day -day basis, and I say to them, you know, I got a solution for this problem, we're inviting them to say, no, I don't have that problem. I'm all set. Thank you very much. And then everybody gets frustrated because they get rejected instead of getting frustrated because they're asking the wrong question of the wrong person. You know, they're talking to somebody in Chinese when the person only speaks English. Got, got it. And... Uh... So if we now take that um, concept that we have 70% uh, of the market people not really knowing yet they have a problem or there's a great solution for whatever their problem is and, and you want to prospect and, and we live in this connected world, in this world where we're all socially sort of uh, online, digitally aware. Uh, what has changed in prospecting 10 years ago and today? What is, what is the stuff you tell uh, people you advise today that they have to change 
if if they've been doing prospecting for the last 10 years and you you come in there and you figure out oh they're doing it you know the traditional whatever that means and they have to change what is that is there a change in there or is is it are they did they just need to be more digitally aware do they need what is what is the change that is in inherently uh, developed into today's prospecting be, best practice prospecting uh, processes so a whole bunch of things has changed as you know um but to be specific um I think the digital transformation, and in a true sense, is just beginning to, to sort of happen. I think when we had sales 2.0 and there was a lot of that talk, mm -hmm. you know, yes, we moved to digital. We got rid of the analog phone and we got a digital phone, but there wasn't a mindset transformation. I did a blog post today, for instance, about the role of the telephone in the age of asynchronous prospecting, because we've gone to asynchronous prospecting. In the old days, before all the tools were introduced and the tools are good so don't read this the yeah. wrong way but we had synchronous communication right i could call you up i can you know there was more direct contact now my expectation is i'll call you and i'll leave a voicemail you'll listen to that voicemail in a couple of hours make a decision and then probably respond so the, the communication is asynchronous so we need to now communicate in a way that allows for that because it's not going to change right i use voicemail to check who's calling me and if i don't want to talk to you you know you're getting the 76 and if i want to talk to you i'll call you back but it's going to be sometime after you left that method of communication but we've both been involved in deals where we've moved some fairly complex deals along without ever talking directly to people mm -hmm. just through email you know and, and voicemail and other forms of asynchronous communication so i think that's changed and i think one of the things the argument i make in my post today is that most people's mindsets haven't changed from the old days where they want to, they're using technology to recreate a past that's not going to come back. And that is synchronous communication and prospecting or sales, right? So all these tools that are being introduced, I sometimes wonder why they're being introduced because I think they're great tools, but they just reinforce old habits. So it's a lot like the problem that people had when they first rolled out CRMs. You know, from what I'm reading, it's still the case that most people have two rollouts, the first time and then the second time when it really works, right? But when they roll out CRMs, you know, like there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of promise, but you know, it doesn't necessarily change the productivity of people. So you have these tools that are reinforcing old ways of thinking and saying, you know what, we can automate that for you. So let's not name any companies, but there's a number of tools out there that help you with follow throughs, which is a real issue, right? Because if you're prospecting on a mass basis, which you're forced to do in the SaaS model, right? Because you're pouring things into the bucket and, and you know, you hope one or two hit, right? So as you do that, Sorry about that. <laughs> I got <guess> that one. <laughs> so as you do that, you know, I read this interesting stat that in any given CRM, you can have anywhere from 100 to 300 unfollowed up items, right? So these are follow-ups that you scheduled because you thought they were important to the sale, but you didn't follow up on them. And it's not because they're evil or stupid, they just don't have the time, right? There's only 24 hours and you gotta go home and kiss the wife once in a while, right? So they come out with a tool that creates this automation and, and you know now allows you to create sequences and workflows and all that. But it's all in an effort to recreate that synchronous communication. And what's interesting is most of those are devoid of voicemail, which is a necessary tool if you're going to succeed these days. So I think I look at change in three ways. The tools have changed very much so, mostly for the better. Then within those that circle, there's another tool as to how do people use it. And think about it like technology evolves a lot faster than our psyche and our physiology. So it takes us time to, you know, catch up with all the great tools that the kids in Silicon Valley are putting out, right? So, but in the middle, if you look at, let's go back to our friend who's 57% of the way of his or her journey, right? The reason they got off their ass to do something is something prompted them. And that central prompting, the why hasn't changed, right? So most businesses still have an objective. Right? So whether that objective is to overcome the immediate pain or whether that objective is to corner the market in China for shoes, it doesn't matter. It's an objective. And if you switch your prospecting to talking about what objectives you can help them deliver, 
I think you'll find a much broader range of the market talking to you. And I think that's what needs to change is that we need to be able to prospect in the way that you prompted me to answer, which is to go out there and identify people who will deliver value in the future, much like the guy at the side of the river doesn't realize instantaneous cash. It has to go through a process, but you got to start that somewhere. And I'd rather get to the 70% and form their thinking before they become active mode, because then I own their, you know, I'm their emotional favorite at that point. So that's to me what it's changed. And- and, and, and so if, if let's imagine sort of a, a small business owner, he's successful, he's got a little bit of a retail shop and he's thinking about sort of... I only do retail, I don't do retail. Uh, you have to imagine somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go, going into sort of, uh, let, let's then imagine a, a small B2B shop, uh, sorry, uh, service business. And um, he, he's really looking and stepping up and, and, and he gets it, he's listening to our uh, podcast and he's saying, okay, so what, what should I do on Monday? What's, what's, where do I start in this transformation? What is, uh, he's, he does do Facebook, he does uh, look at Twitter, but he's not really ac- active, so he's not connected. Um, he understands there's a digital aspect, he understands uh, uh, there's, a, there's a market out there that's interesting for him um, in, in the sense that, um, you know, he, he has a sense maybe we could do some business there. What would you suggest to him? What does he do on day one or on the week? And I know it's it's sort of a very wide uh, question, but 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 if is there something that you've always seen happens in the first week, second week of of an engagement like that? Yeah, I mean, I think you go right back to you know Adam and Eve, and you look at what the serpent did, and he got to know the audience, right? So I think the first thing you get to do is understand what is going to move the audience, right? So, you know, go back to some of your best customers and understand what objectives you help them achieve. And that involves something that a lot of sales organizations, and it's difficult to do. So, you know, again, I'm not pointing fingers because I don't always do it as much as I talk about it. Um, It's, you know, to go (laughs) back six months after the fact, right? Like you've installed this solution, favorite word of salespeople, right? This solution, you know? So ostensibly if it's a solution you solve the problem that they have right so go back and find out how their life has changed six months later is their workflow different you know are they looking at their business differently are they communicating with their customers differently find out how they communicate so you know again like when i got recognized for that social selling i sort of laughed because i don't think of myself as a social seller i think of myself as a salesperson and I remember speaking to the people who organized this, the, the, the study. And I said, you know, have you read my stuff? I tend to make fun of social selling, right? And they said, no, we didn't read your stuff. We just looked at your activity. So I think that, you know, if you're going to prospect successfully, stop picking lanes and, and pick an expanding toolkit, right? So I, if I'm trying to sell to somebody who, quote unquote, millennial in their 30s, I'm going to lean to the social tools and the social way of approaching them because it's more important for me to speak their language than to try and convert them to mine, right? But if I'm going to reach out to someone my age, let's face it, like I think I'm an anomaly in terms of my activity on social media. I'm into my 60s. I have no issues with it. But if I was to call it, if I was to pursue a peer, I'd probably lean towards, you know, the traditional way. Because again, with me, you can get to me through different ways, but the phone is probably my favorite still. Just an element of my age. I recognize it, right? Um, you know, geography and position within the company, right? So if you're selling to a small, you know, sort of tech cloud company, you're going to talk one way and you're going to emphasize certain things, right? Depending on what stage of evolution they're in. So all these things, so I think that the one thing that I talk to my customers about is they're always looking for that one secret thing. And if you ask the one that I don't like about the book shift, it has that stupid line on the back about the silver bullet in sales. Well, there is no silver bullet in sales. You know, we're not hunting werewolves. We're hunting revenue. And that means that we have to match and be able to engage with people of different sorts, right? So picking one bet, I think, is just stupid. I think what you need to do or what that small business person needs to do is go out there, understand who his best customers are, ignore everybody else. That's one thing that small business people tend to do. They say, this is my box, but I'm going to look a little bit here and I'm going to look a little bit there but that's just time and energy that's taken away from the box that's gonna pay the bills. 
So I think that when they go out there and they begin to understand who their customers are and how those customers buy, what those customers are trying to achieve, and if in fact they do go back to existing customers six months later, a year later, and find out how their world has changed and then talk about that, because if you're able to change one company's world, you can probably do the same for others. Um, and the other thing that they need to do, which is hard for a lot of salespeople to do, and I understand why, so is to go back and understand why they lost. Most salespeople don't understand why they lost. And again, I'm not being negative. Um, I think once a company makes a decision to purchase a solution, you know, when the salesperson coming back and say, why did you pick somebody else? It sort of sounds like sour grapes, right? And they've already switched into implementation mode. So their mindset is already, let's get this thing done. They're past the decision. So I think companies need to get their marketing team involved because I think they can ask different questions. I think they could learn a lot of stuff. Like if you didn't buy from me and the reason you didn't buy from me is because you don't like the way I sell or maybe I wasn't articulate enough. You're not going to tell me. You're going to tell me it's price and product, right? You don't like your product. You didn't have the right features and it was too expensive, right? But if you can get somebody else in, like a marketing person or whatever, who's gotten no skin in the game ostensibly, right? They can ask some really deep questions that would go not only to what happened in the sale, but get some deep understanding of, you know, what we could do differently, which is, again, one of the things that I would suggest that, you know, if they were ever to rewrite the book shift, it shouldn't just be a win analysis. You should be looking at why you won, why you lost and why there was a no decision. OK. Uh and in your um, in your past history working with um, B two B companies, tell me, is there one example of a very transformed prospecting um, setup? So before you came in and after, what was the big change that happened, and why did it happen? What were the most uh, positive uh, elements of that change? What 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 really happened? The the, the 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 results and the KPIs or whatever you were measuring at the time actually transformed so so radically. So I think people can go to my website on the clients page and get some case studies that speak specifically to this. I'll talk about two. Um, you know, I can talk about three, but two are good. Um, there's one, there's a Canadian bank that specifically exists for uh, small businesses. So their mandate is to finance small businesses. Um, and according to their accounts, so this is their stats and all that, when I first went in there, um, I worked with them for about three years. Uh, when I first went in there, their people were getting, on average, 0.6 appointments a week. So every two weeks, they would have just over one appointment, right? Whereas by the time they finished the program, and when I was working with them, the program was eight weeks. Each iteration was eight weeks. They were up to 4.6 appointments per week per rep. Um, so this is their internal count. I didn't have access to the stats. Um, I think that the thing, you know, what's consistent across all the board is it's all well and good to talk about a prospecting methodology, but if it doesn't get put into practice, then it's useless, right? You know, it's like there's an interesting commercial in the States now, because I'm in Canada, but it's interesting to watch, um, where they're talking about medical, you know, they're talking about prescription drugs, and this one guy, poor guy's got Parkinson's, and he's shaking, trying to open the medicine bottle, and he's going, prescription drugs are great as long as you can afford them. So, you know, um, you know, so, um, where were we taking this? Um, so if, if you can, I think, it's figure the, out. It's the prospect. So, so we, we're trying to figure out what was that specific thing that made that difference in before right. you came in and so after. I think so what, what I figured out early, and I think I learned this when I was on the other side of the table, is that you can have great content, but if it doesn't get put into practice, then you're beat. So I, all my programs, so not only do I have a sales methodology, but there's also a training methodology, which I think is important. I learned that as I went along from some learning and development people. So the change comes from the follow through. So we have a workshop that's very structured. At the end of the workshop, they have to commit to three things that they're going to put into action. They get to pick what it is, but it has to be actionable stuff. And then we work with them over the next 10 weeks to put those things into action. And through working to put them into action, there's a whole bunch of other things that come up and come, become open. 
And the other thing that we ensure during those 12 weeks is that they're actually doing it because it is a question of habits, right? Like there's no secret here. Anybody that tells you that they have a secret is lying to you, right? It's, you know, it's re repetition. It's the same thing like in sports and so on. Yes, there's some God-given talent and all that, but if you practice and do things, you will get better at it. And that's what basically I do during those 10 weeks is I make them do it. Because, you know, most sales training programs, a lot of salespeople take the view that, you know, this too will pass and they keep their head down for two weeks. And generally in two weeks, it does pass, right? With me, they look up and I'm still there going, where's my calls and where's my emails, you know? So I think that that's where the change comes is that they're held accountable, but I'm also accountable for their success. So like there's this two-way street, it's not just me taking, but it's giving. And I think as they have small incremental success around things that they pick, it's easy to then stretch them and challenge them and bring them out a little bit more. And so the other I... one I would yes. sorry. So, the other so, one is a recruiting firm that apparently tells me that I increased their uh, pipeline by 25%. Again, case study on the website. So, so is in short, is is do you think the discipline of execution is is basically the difference between succeeding and not succeeding? The discipline of making that that those new habits. And I get it. It's it's sort of a, yeah. you know, but but. People sometimes forget that. I mean, you know, when people have, are having a hard time, they forget that it's, you know, sometimes it's the bottom line is there's no silver bullet. There's not, a, a, you know, you've, you've taken all the knowledge you have. You've, you've gone through all the concepts. But if you really want to be successful, there is, there is the everyday discipline of actually doing the same repetitive things you should be doing. And if you're not doing them, you have zero chance of success. Is is is. Uh, I would I make like one, one teeny weeny little thing, and it's more me yeah. than anything yeah. you said, which is not the same thing over and over, but the right thing over and over. And that right yes. thing is going to evolve, right? So, you know, there was a time where I wouldn't have done certain things that I do now, right? And vice versa. So, but everything else you said uh, is correct. I, 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 you're totally right. I, I totally agree. It's, you, you can't be doing the same thing. It's evolving, but it's evolving in incremental yeah. steps. It's, it's like, it's 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 if you're not involving in incremental steps, you're not gonna get there because the world is evolving very fast, and you have to sort of adapt. But if you go back to then, um, you know, until you get that twelve week or whatever that period is where you're adapting to the new stuff, what is the what what's the KPIs? What are the what's the stuff you're measuring at the beginning before you're actually set the KPIs that are sort of long term, or do you have do you know the KPIs on day one? before you even uh, uh, finish that initial uh, phase of, of, of a project? So some KPIs you know, and some KPIs you don't, and you have to set them. So I find that some organizations know certain numbers they have or certain metrics, but most of them they seem to know in the active stage of the sale. Now, they are getting better because, again, a, a positive of some of the tools that have come about in the last few years is that they're getting much better at talking about conversion and, and things along those lines. What there isn't, I think there's room to improve on and it's getting better. So is, is making sure that when five people say conversion, all five mean the same thing because, you know, I've seen different definitions of where things are at. So I, you know, I think that everybody knows what their goal is, right? So whether you're given a unit that they have to sell or revenue increase or whatever, everybody's given a, a quota at the beginning of the year. So there's a KPI, probably the big one, right? So then the question is, and, and, and the mantra that I have, and, and, and you know, one of my clients has it painted up on the wall, is own your own numbers, right? So most salespeople think that the numbers are something for management, but you got to own your own numbers, right? So like an athlete doesn't wait for the newspaper to report their numbers. They know, you know, whatever sport you like, they know what 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 they're doing and, and so forth. So the other KPIs, in a sense, and, and this could be an entirely whole different uh, podcast because I have this activity tool that, that I use for a whole bunch of different things, including coaching. But what I do with that is that I get them to measure two things. What does it take for them to take somebody who said, yes, I'll talk to you through to completion? So I get them to measure three things. How many of your initial engagements lead to discovery? So if you have an initial call or initial meeting, how many people say, you know what, I don't know if I'll buy from you, but uh, yeah, come back and we'll talk some more. We'll explore this a bit further, right? 
And then how many of those discoveries lead to proposal? And then how many of those proposals actually close, right? Now you'd be surprised how many people don't know that. Um, now, again, with technology, it's getting easier and easier to get to it. But because the technology knows it, that doesn't help you. You should know what your own numbers are. Otherwise, what are you gonna change, right? And that's, you know, so with those KPIs, so the other thing I get them to measure on a more tactical basis is how many attempts do they need to make to engage with the right person? So whether it's a phone call or an email and that lead to a positive interaction. So in the case of a traditional sales guy like me, appointments, right? So how many calls to speak to the right people to get the appointment? Again, that's old school type of thinking. Now it's more like, okay, how many attempts? So did you send them an email? Did you go to LinkedIn and this and that? Again, asynchronous, you're not always going to speak, but you could get a positive response that leads to an interaction and so on. You know, so, the, but the relationship is the same. We're measuring how, how many raw materials defined and segmented and all that do we have to put at the beginning of the conveyor belt for it to go through the factory to come out with, you know, a sale. And so with the activity tool, what we could do is A, put a focus on the fact that they don't know what their numbers are, so that drives the need for them to know. And then we get them to commit, okay, so which of these numbers are you want to change, right? Because again, we don't want to dictate to them. People would rather do things that they think they want to do. But as soon as they commit to one of those changing, we now have a, the need to put together a change plan. So now the manager can become actually a coach. And, and through that, we change that. And then we celebrate the success that they have. And we go, okay, which number do you want to change next? And now they're willing because, you know, they've not only improved their numbers, but generally as a result of that, they've improved their pipeline. They've improved, you know, their their, their income potential and their boss is not uh, yelling at them anymore, right? So, you know, so we keep building on that. So if you ask me, the key numbers is number of attempts, right person connects, and then actionable results. Um, and then the other three in sale is how many of those initial actionable results lead to a discovery and then how many discovery to proposal and how many do you bring home? Perfect. One last question. Prospecting mm -hmm. unbound. What is the unbound uh, well, stand know, for? This yeah. is to our viewers. You know, there's this all, the, the one thing that sales does really well is try and mimic marketing for no reason at all. And, you know, so they come up with all these stupid, you know, things. I own the domain, you know, unhyphenate sales, right? Because there's all these hyphenated sales. It's like going to the UN, right? So, you know, you got this tug of war between inbound and outbound. You got these poor salespeople trying to figure out <laughs> what the hell am I supposed to do? Is it inbound? Is it outbound? You know, if I do this, are the girls not going to like me anymore? You know, so I figured I would liberate them and say, hey, prospecting unbound, we remove the limits on your prospecting. So it's a two-day virtual summit that's taking place October 16 and 17. I don't know if this will be out before or after, but all the presentations, there's 13 experts talking about all elements of prospecting from hiring to managing, compensation, techniques, technology. So it'll be up and available to people. And I was going to say we have success, but when we show success next week, um, we'll probably repeat these on a semi-annual basis. Great. Uh, what does Tibor do when you're not prospecting and doing podcasts? Um, I tend to read. I used to run, but due to an injury, I had to stop doing that. Um, I like to listen to music. Uh, tell me, uh, tell our viewers what's the best way. I understand uh, traditional uh, uh, phone, but uh, how can they con connect with you? Uh, I'm sure they'll find some very interesting uh, insights uh, after this podcast. So uh, let's see. Um, What's the best way to connect? With so I used to say the easiest is the phone, but I think probably the easiest, in fact, these days is LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, it's T-I-B-O-R-S-H-A-N-T-O. But for those of you with silver hair like me, it's plus one, four, one, six, eight, two, two, seven, seven, eight, one. Uh, Tibor, thank you very much. Uh, I, I will definitely um, uh, remember one very interesting sort of insight that I, I learned today that... Um, Although we live in a uh, in a synchronous world, mm -hmm. uh, we are sort of um, we have the um, uh, challenge of actually 
uh, communicating a asynchronously. We have to be very effective, especially in the, the prospecting and sales. And, and so how do you sort of live in a, in a synchronous world and yet uh, be uh, efficient in, in dealing with an asynchronous prospecting uh, cycle? Uh, it's, a, it's a very sort of uh, fundamental, um, uh, true, uh, as I would say, view of the world. And, and, and I have really not heard this before and i heard it today and 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 helping people deal with 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 that fact is 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 very important because uh, uh dealing with that fact means uh, uh probably more revenue probably means more uh, success there's, uh in 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 the, in the long term there's another element to the asynchronous element and i don't want to take up your time but there's also the notion that most salespeople are living in the here and present um 70% of the people, the status quo, are living somewhere else. So the other thing that they have to shift is what was your prospect thinking 18 months before they called you? Because if you're telling the 70% something other than that, then you're not communicating with them because they're not here yet. They're still back here. And most marketing and sales messages are yep. here, talking to people who are here, and it just scares them. Yeah. I, I... And as I said, it's it's like there was a lot of big insights, but uh, uh, you know, dealing with uh, the fact that people today do not give you um, give you the time or give you the synchronous uh, bandwidth, but give you sort of a, a slow uh, uh, asynchronous and and being efficient in that kind of a world is is, is very important. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, I hope we'll be able to um, uh, uh, do some stuff and. Um, Thanks. Thank you.